Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. I'm also uh, a bariatric surgeon. And uh, that pertains uh, importantly to today's topic, because today's topic is ghrelin, G-H-R-E-L-I-N, if you want to Google it, um, and hunger. Um, and we're going to break this down. I'm going to give you my perspective, because I get bombarded by the use of the word ghrelin and ghrelin as a hormone and what it does and how bariatric surgery influences ghrelin. And also a large part of my um, addiction management process is about helping people to understand and deal with hunger. So let's talk about ghrelin. Ghrelin is a hormone that gets produced in the stomach and the pancreas, mostly in the upper GI tract. And uh, it, it is a hormone that is a precursor hormone that gets released and then it gets cleaved and becomes an active hormone. And we're just starting to understand what ghrelin uh, um, uh, does. And it does a whole bunch of different things. But there are two parts that a large part of the weight loss community have attached to the word ghrelin, particularly my colleagues in the obesity space. And they say, oh, ghrelin is the hunger hormone. It drives hunger and it's the reason people are fat and people with high levels of ghrelin uh, are hungry. They eat all the time and that's why they fat. And if we can get rid of ghrelin, if we can get rid of ghrelin, we can reduce hunger and they won't eat as much, and they won't be fat. <laughs> That's, that is one of the most ridiculous pieces of bullshit conjuring that I've ever heard. But my colleagues are totally into this thing, because what they say is, when we do a sleeve gastrectomy, you're removing 85 90% of the stomach. When you're uh, doing a gastric bypass, you're creating a, an upper little pouch and removing the lower part of the stomach, not removing it, but removing it from circuit. So they say, oh, look, the patients are not hungry after they've, after they've had their surgery and they lose massive amounts of weight because they're not hungry. And it's because we eliminated ghrelin. That's what we do. Bullshit. Because you didn't become fat because you had ghrelin. And there's a little bit of evidence in this regard. Okay. A little bit of evidence in this regard, and I'll explain the, the lack of hunger when you've had surgery, but here's the way it works. If you look at ghrelin level measures, the general group, there are two groups of people where ghrelin level are the levels are the highest. People with anorexia. Anorexia nervosa has very high ghrelin levels. Well, they're the skinniest people out there. So they're not responding to their ghrelin. It's almost this dysfunctional hunger pain that they're getting, and they're not, not feeding it. But on the flip side, some of the most resistant, fattest people are, are kids and, and young adults with something called Prader-Willi syndrome. And in Prader-Willi syndrome, there's an abundance of ghrelin, and they eat all the time, and they can't stop eating. Although we've had tremendous success with our Prader-Willi uh, patients, I don't buy into that ghrelin theory. I buy more into the carbohydrate theory with Prader Willi. But that's if you've got Prader Willi or if you've been diagnosed with that, give us a shout. We can give you a different insight. That's not the topic of today's talk. But folks, here's the interesting thing. The people with the lowest ghrelin levels are the fattest people. The fattest people have the lowest ghrelin levels, and yet they're always hungry and they're always looking for an opportunity to eat. Because that's the driving force behind obesity. And when you do surgery, clearly for the first few months, the beauty about surgery, it's the most powerful diet out there. What bariatric surgery does is it just gets rid of appetite. But it's not based on ghrelin removal. It's not based on ghrelin. It's based on the transformation of the stomach and signaling of satiety back to the brain which is based on stretch receptors in the stomach, not hormonal receptors. Something called EGLES, E-G-L-E-S receptors, where a small amount of food stretches the stomach and those signals go back to the brain and say, I'm full. But just like if you regularly wear glasses, you're unaware of the fact that you are. If you've got earrings or a piercing and you've had it for more than two or three weeks, you're unaware of it. Over time, those nerve single signals, very powerful early on after you rearrange the stomach because you're overdoing things, you don't know how to work with your stomach, and the signals go back to, oh, God, that hurts, or I'm, I'm feeling full. Or, but over time, you realign and you live with that, 
and you figure out ways around it and the surgeries fail 85% of the time because the people didn't change their habits. Surgery is very effective for weight loss. And I'm a huge advocate of that for some people who struggle. But ultimately, if you don't change your behavior pattern, it doesn't work effectively long term. So it fails 85 plus percent of the time in terms of permanent weight loss because people don't address their behavior. And, oh, ghrelin levels come back. No, they don't. It's got nothing to do with ghrelin, folks. Ghrelin has been labeled as the hunger hormone. And if we get rid of ghrelin, your hunger goes away. And that may be true if you're a rat in a cage. If you're a rat in a cage or an animal, that may be true. And I'm going to explain hunger in a second. The other thing that Grayland does is it works centrally in the brain and gives you a sense of uh, satiety when the levels are low. So Graylin triggers uh, uh, that conscious, oh, I've got to have something. It's, an addict- it's a pro-addictive hormone. And it probably has more influence in the central brain. But if anybody ever out there, a dietitian, a coach, a manager, a bariatric surgeon, your doctor says, oh, this thing, it's about your ghrelin levels, and we've got to eat multiple small meals a day to decrease your ghrelin, or this surgery is going to reduce your ghrelin, and you're going to feel not hungry. Guys. Pack up your bags and run, 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 run away because that person knows nothing about carbohydrate addiction. You see, hunger is an important trigger. Hunger is an important trigger for communities who do not have access to a reliable source of food. So in the old days, when we lived on the plains of Africa in a little hut and we got hungry, it meant we had a nutritional requirement. That's our body saying, dude, you need to go find some food. And we'd grab our digging sticks and we'd grab our bows and arrows and we'd go out in the plains of Africa and we'd try to hunt something or dig something up to eat because hunger used to be a nutritional driving force. Absolutely correct. But that's so far back in our evolutionary history. Hunger in the modern world is far, far more commonly related to this, not this. You see, look around you right now. Look around you right now. I bet you, for the most part, you live the majority of your life within 50 yards or 50 meters of an abundance of food. If you're sitting at home, there's a fridge, there's a pantry. If you're at work, there's probably some... some form of crap to eat lying around you. And if you're driving down the road, there's probably a a fast food store or restaurant that you're driving past on a regular basis. In the modern era, we're having to deal with a tsunami of food. And it's actually this that we're having to do, not, oh my God, where's the food? So hunger is no longer a nutritional driving force. So what is hunger? Hunger for most of us is the equivalent of saying, I need a cigarette. (laughs) Let's face it, folks, nobody needs a cigarette. What a cigarette does is a cigarette is a delivery system for um, nicotine, and nicotine is an incredibly powerful instant gratification drug. As soon as it hits our brain, it gives us an instant reward of tranquility, of relaxation, of dissipation of emotional tension, and nicotine is an incredibly powerful, incredibly valuable drug to use in a dysfunctional way to deal with emotional need. And it would be wonderful if it didn't have one little wrinkle, and that is that it's probably going to kill us. So just along those lines, let me get on my soapbox here, because guys, when I talk to my school teacher patients and I talk to my educators, they are alarmed, alarmed, at the fact that 35 to 50% of high school kids vape on a regular basis. And the tobacco companies have made jewel and vaping such a sexy thing. And that nicotine is going to cause them trouble in the next 20 years. Nobody's talking about it. We're talking about opioids. We're talking about COVID. We're not talking about the two commonest forms of dysfunctional emotional management, which is carbohydrates and nicotine. And it's killing our youth. It's going to kill our youth. 
and we've got this next wave of metabolic dysfunction and cardiovascular dysfunction from nicotine and carbohydrates. Be that as it may, when somebody says, oh, I need a cigarette, that is always, always an emotional event. And when a fat person says, oh, I'm hungry, it has nothing to do with eating. Hunger is saying, I'm having a little emotional tension. I'm stressed. I'm bored. I'm, I'm, I'm anxious. I need something to eat. And what they're saying is they need carbohydrates, which is the equivalent of nicotine, which is the drug that goes to your head, that gives you that emotional relief. I'm hungry. <clears throat> Folks, a snack is always an emotional event. Now, a bridge gets me over that little emotional event without causing caloric harm. So it's interesting that a snack is not always a carbohydrate. It could be pepperoni and cheese, but it's still calories for your head and you're feeding hunger. And you say, oh, but that can't be true. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. When I'm hungry, my stomach's growling. A growling stomach is just fluid and air passing through your intestine. Enjoy it, folks. That's going to be a fart in a few day, in a few hours' time. Sh get ready to share it with a friend. But that's not tell you're not your body telling you when your stomach rumbles. It's not your body telling you, oh, I need nutrition. And particularly if you're fat, you don't need nutrition, dude. Dine in. Have a little bit of this. And then the other part about hunger, which is interesting. Uh, I, and this is the part where I love what Jason Fung has done with intermittent fasting that's so popular and so sexy right now. And I'm not talking about intermittent fasting of, oh, I, I went 16 hours. That's not intermittent fasting. That's just not eating. If you can't go 16 hours without eating, you're seriously in trouble. Be that as may, that's, again, for another talk. And yeah, I'm standing on my soapbox here because that's all the bullshit that people come at me with. Oh, I've got to eat small meals a day. I've got to feel I'm hungry. I've got to eat. Oh, you should always eat when you're hungry. Well, I'm always hungry. That's why I became 300 pounds. But here's the cool part about what Jason Fung does. Is if you've ever tried a longer fast, a 72-hour, a three-day, a five-day fast, longer fast, the amazing thing is that after about 24 to 36 hours, typically, for me, it's after 24 hours. When I wake up the next morning and I've gone 24 hours without eating, I'm just not hungry. I'm just not hungry. And the beauty about intermittent fasting is the deeper into ketosis you go, the longer you fast, no calories, the less hungry you are, the less you need food. So how is it possible that hunger denotes a nutritional requirement when you can fast for five days and not feel hungry at all? That's illogical. Hunger has nothing in the modern era to do with nutritional requirement. It has to do with addiction. It has to do with emotion management in a dysfunctional way. It has to do with eating and drinking calories for their emotional dissipation. And that's why we're fat and sick. That's why we have diabetes. That's why we have metabolic syndrome. And folks, ghrelin has nothing to do with that. Because if that was true, your ghrelin levels should go up and up and up the longer you fast and you should get more and more hungry. But the beauty of what Jason has shown us, Dr. Fung, F-U-N-G, if you don't know him, Google him. The beauty of what Jason has shown us is that the longer we fast, the less hungry we are. And hormonally, we return to what's called a demand state, which is where your cells are demanding nutrients from your stores. And it's a long time before those stores run out. So forget about the word Graylin, folks. Just, just drop it. it. It really is irrelevant in the modern era. If you're dealing with obesity, if you're dealing with surgery, if you're dealing with bariatric surgery, if you're dealing with metabolic syndrome, diabetes... Forget about the word hunger. Understand the word addiction. Because if you don't treat your addiction, no gastric resection, no bariatric surgery will ever, ever work long term. It has nothing to do with Graylin. Send me your comments. Send me your science. Oh, but this, oh, but that. Never met a fat person who said, oh, my Graylin levels are high. I need to eat. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. I hope I've made you think. Slowly but surely, we're hopefully changing the perspective of the world around what the true problem here is. 
The true problem here is dysfunctional emotional management, self-esteem, self-confidence, and the comprehensive deficiency of an effective emotion management strategy that is diverse and supportive in a positive way of who we are as human beings. Addiction is very destructive, psychologically and physically. Recognize the difference between nutrition and addiction. If you need help, we can help you. Reach out to us for a consult, 561-517-0642, phone or text. And if you like our content, folks, um, our PayPal account is robert at jackschildren, J-A-X-C-H-I-L-D-R-E-N.com. Throw a few dollars to us. That is a charitable organization. So that money goes purely to charity to make the uh, this educational content available. I do not benefit fiscally from that whatsoever. But it keeps these videos free, keeps them going, keeps the work that we do free. Obviously, when I consult on patients, that's my job. Uh, there is a payment structure. We use insurance of all different types. But you're paying for the content. Help us out. I hope that resonates. I know it's controversial what I just said. Leave me your comments, and I'll try to respond to them. But think, folks, think. And if someone says Graylin, run. Run.